All right, hello and welcome to another Expert Inside interview. My name is John Golden from Sales Pop, online sales magazine and Pipeliner CRM. Joining you as usual from San Diego. And today I am delighted to be joined from across the country on the far coast, Tommy McNulty, who is in New York City. How are you doing, Tommy? I'm doing great. Thank you for having me. Of course, and Tommy is the founder and CEO of Rhythm, the first platform dedicated to helping sales leaders scale themselves and their teams, enable managers, and deliver a culture of performance at any stage of growth. And what we're going to talk about today is how to use sales P&L to be a people-first leader. And uh, and Tommy, let's let's just jump straight into it, right? Sales P&L. That ju- I can see a lot of sales managers and sales people going, whoa, 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 hold on a second, sales P&L, what's that? <laughs> yeah, um, and I, I was certainly one of those people. And to maybe set a little bit of context here, I'll tell you just a quick yeah. story on why I decided to start this company. So um, I used to be a VP of sales and I had a, a, relative, a pretty large team. And it was 2019, we had a board meeting coming up and... I got an email from one of the board members the night before the board meeting, uh, which said, you know, hey, Tommy, did you know that the SDR team uh, is 70% of our CAC or our customer acquisition cost? Right. Dot, dot, dot. What are you doing to drive this down? You know, hint, I didn't know the SDR team was 70% of the, <laughs> of the customer acquisition co- cost. And I, so I certainly didn't have a plan to drive it down. You know, I was just patting myself on the back because we were setting meetings. SDR team was crushing it. Um, so I thought at least, and it was in that moment where I realized that in the role that I was in as a VP of sales or or sort of like an owner of this large swath of spending and revenue generation that the company had, if I didn't get really fluent in these types of metrics and decisions made around these metrics, I would wreak havoc on, on the business. Um, and in this case, I had allowed our lead generation team to really eat in to our acquisition costs, which were, right. were which was actually making the whole sales team unprofitable. So, when I say sales P and L, I mean the metrics that are one layer up from what a sales leader is usually looking at. So, VP of Sales CRO, we're looking at activity and pipeline yep. and rep by rep performance. These aren't contrarian ideas, but there's a whole nother swath of metrics that those roll into customer acquisition costs, lifetime value, profitability, profitability by customer segment, payback periods, all of these things that your CFO is looking at every single day. Mm -hmm. And I believe, um, and I I shouldn't even say I believe this, I, I think I know this to be true, that in the world we're in today, bottom line profit yeah. maximization yeah. is back in fashion right um yeah. and yes. uh right for and, some of us it never went out of fashion because we believe that's how <laughs> it should operate but hey <laughs> yeah you know i um I, I pretty much only worked in startups my whole career and a couple that really worked out a couple that didn't and um it's just been this constant all the tactics were focused around grow 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 right doesn't really matter don't worry about the money just grow um, that's changed, right? And yeah. now as sales leaders, we need to make sure that all the things we do, all the decisions we make, practices we put into place, there has to be a pile of money left over <laughs> at yeah. the end of yeah. that. Um, yeah, exactly. One of the things, Tommy, and I think it's really interesting, uh, I dealt with this a number of years ago myself when I uh, I took over running a couple of businesses for, for a, a large parent company. And one of them, I didn't understand the revenue was pretty darn good, right? But the profitability was awful. Like the operating profit was next to nothing. And I was like, this is insane. And sure enough, when I dug into it, I realized that we were basically selling loads of unprofitable business. And there were all these hidden costs that nobody was tracking. It's like using resources without ever using resources from across the company, but never factoring them in. Yeah, exactly. And it... It's one of these things where you're, you're, as a sales leader, the math is going to have to work. And yeah. the math might not work today, and that might be okay. That might be a deliberate decision. Yeah. But as a sales leader, you need to know how far away you are from the math working. Are mm-hmm. you 100% away? Are you 50% away? Are you really close? And 
that needs to sort of be your syllabus for yeah. the decisions you make uh, on the sales org. And in the case that you just mentioned, it's like, you know, it's a bit of a sleight of hand, right? Like revenue is really good, but oh, by the way, like we will run out of money. Like this business will actually go bankrupt if we keep doing <laughs> what we're doing, even though revenue is really good. So yeah. it's it's important to recognize those things. Yeah, yeah. So we did in the end, we put in a a, a deal profitability calculator and they had to calculate mm -hmm. all the costs in, including all the ones that they weren't, didn't usually calculate in. Because, and we used to use this analogy, right, was the biggest destroyer of homes in the US is not, and we used to do this at presentations, like, what's the biggest destroyer? Is it, who, who thinks it's fire in some people? Who thinks it's flood? Uh, it's termites. <laughs> it's termites. It's the hidden, it's the hidden one that's eating away at your house and you don't know. And we always said it's the hidden costs that are eating away at your business that you don't know about. Uh. Oh, my, my former head of sales ops would have, would have loved you. He, <laughs> he used to see, he used to say, um, we will not die by one strike of the sword. We will be, we will be death by a thousand cuts <laughs> on, 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 on how money is leaving the business. Um, and it's, it's hard, right? Because we're, we're sellers. You grow up as an SDR, as an AE, as a sales manager, you're not trained on accounting. You're not trained mm -hmm. on how to look at the EBITDA of your business or your trend lines or your segment by segment profitability, you're, you're closing deals. And, mm -hmm. you know, I think the, um, the black box nature of, of how these metrics and decisions are kept inside of companies really in the office of the CEO just has to democratize to everybody yeah. and everybody. It's, it's, it's gotta be like profits, a team sport. Yeah. And, and I think the other thing, Tommy, uh, I think you'd agree is that, the nature of business, I mean, it's changed so much now that it's not that these old ideas of like demarcation and everything being neatly in boxes. I mean, it doesn't really exist anymore. So you have to you have to look at a lot of different dimensions. And, you know, there's a lot of different people who are operating sort of around sales now as well, if not directly in it. Absolutely. And the job of a sales leader at a growing company isn't isn't just to hit your number today, it's to start putting the wheels in motion to hit your number six, nine, 18 months from now. And that's that's kind of a creative exercise, right? Yeah. Like yeah. you're gonna use data and you're gonna use insights to inform that, but you're starting that process of what's gonna be different about this organization between now and then that's gonna allow us to go from, you know, call it five to $10 million. And you're right, it's not, it's not this neat like add AE get amount of money because you have yeah. to connect your lead generation and your pipeline carry and you got to make sure you hire the right people and you pay them correctly. So there's a lot that happens in that process. And I mean, I think the other thing too is I think uh, I think a lot of times, especially nowadays, we lose track of all the like the tools people are using, the extra things they're buying, you know, and all this. There's a lot of there's a lot of of extra expense <laughs> that's in sales now. There wasn't once upon a time. And again, I think that's something that people often overlook too. Yeah. I mean, we, we have a lot more stuff now than we yeah. used to. I mean, when I started in sales, it was Salesforce and a phone, right? That was, that mm -hmm. was the, that was the stack. Yeah. Um, and we had a data team that was feeding leads into Salesforce and we've come a long way, right? Email sequencers and call recorders yeah. and, uh, collateral builders, all these different mm -hmm. things. And, um, you know, the, this is not to knock the sales enablement world, because I think that sure. some of these tools are fantastic, but, you know, the quota hit rate has remained steady yeah. right, this whole time. So 10 years ago, we were at uh, roughly 60% of people were hitting their sales goal. Today, we're roughly at a 60% of people hitting their sales goal. So, you know, you have, if I was a CFO right now, I would be looking at every every tool that I have in the stack. Okay, like, does this does this actually generate the value that we mm -hmm. thought it was going to generate? I get that people like it. I get that it's cool. Yeah. I get that it makes people's lives easier. <laughs> but if I got rid of it, will this rep still generate 100K per month or will they actually go down to 70K per month? And I think that's a question a lot of people are asking themselves right now. And I think that's a profound point there that I think everybody should take. Everybody should ask themselves that question because I guarantee you, you're spending way more per salesperson than you've ever been spending in the past because of all these tools. And you say, yeah, there's a lot of great tools, some of them very useful, but are you getting the return on them? And are you, you know, is the, is the cost, uh, you know, benefit uh, equation there? 
Yeah, and, and, and it could be. It, it's just the these tools are these tools are expensive, right? They're not they're not cheap. They're not cheap, right? If you if you think about outreach, Salesforce, Gong, call it mm -hmm. like plus two for yeah. your sales organization, you're looking at 10k per year per person in yeah. in sales tech, right? Um, it's it's a lot. If you if you have a sizable sales team, that's gonna that's gonna be a, a pretty mm -hmm. large bill you have every year, and you better be able to defend it. So what are what are some of the other ways that you you um, would advise uh, sales organizations how to use you know a, a sales PL, but how they can use it to really help themselves stay stay focused because I think one of the other things too is is the scattered approach to business because like you said if you're not assessing you know deals properly how do you know what your ideal customer actually looks like. Because your ideal customer may not be a profitable customer, or that you think, you know. So I mean, if you're not if you're not looking at these things, then maybe you're chasing the wrong customers. Yeah. So I think it's with, with, with a sales leader inside of a company, it, it starts with a pretty simple activity. Yeah. Go and find the person inside your company. Maybe it's a CFO. Maybe it's the head of FP&A. Maybe it's BI, and make them your first meeting at the end of every quarterly close or monthly close or however you do performance cycles mm -hmm. and sit down with them and ask them, like, can we go through everything that happened last month from your vantage point, not from my vantage point as a sales leader, but from your vantage point as the CFO. And that's going to un unveil the four to six things that are really important for your organization. It could be payback periods. It could be lifetime value. It could be renewal rates whatever those look like and you need to get clear on those um and when you get clear on those then as the sales leader you can start to think about your decision making process not just oriented around the here and now and what's mm -hmm. going on this week or going on what's going on today but okay hmm we only return 60 percent of the money we spend on sales back into the company that's actually below the industry benchmark of 80 percent as a sales leader, I'm going to start thinking about how do I find that other 20% of margin? And there's right. a lot of levers you can pull in that, right? Um, you can obviously increase performance, you can decrease costs, and you have to think about that. So it starts with understanding, and then it starts, and then from there it goes to making the appropriate decisions around that understanding. Yeah, no, I, I, I really, I, I agree with you there because I mean that's ex that's exactly it. It is, it is being able to understand all of the levers that you can pull or that you can pull in order to, um, to make it as, as whatever your profitable, whatever your target is, is for that. But at the point though, that has to be kind of systematic across the whole sales organization, and those are the things. And I think that's the other part that it's maybe some sales teams are struggling with now is because they've often got away in the past by, you know, with sales, we've often got away. Oh, it's an art. Leave me alone. It's an art. Mm -hmm. The fact yeah. is that, you know, it's, it's, it, you know, it's part, it's a process like everything else and it's part of a process and there's a lot of different inputs. So part of it means reorienting the thinking of, of, of teams. Yeah. I, I think, I think that sales historically has been, we are a team of of deals to be done right that yeah. is what we do mm -hmm. um and that is true I, I i'm not gonna say that's not true but at the vp of sales slash cro level you need to think about it as a system to be built yeah. that can run that can run itself right and run itself forever and mm -hmm. the, the the telltale sign of a great vp of sales is revenue keeps increasing at a steady <laughs> clip when they leave Right, um, because the system is because it's because the system is there. Um, now, may, maybe if you're a terrible VP of sales and you really weren't closed to anything, then maybe you should go up anyway. But I, uh, you, you get you get what I'm saying. It's like the the system has to be on like has to be able to repeat itself. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And and I think the the other thing that you just alluded to a few minutes ago that I think is really really important too is 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 metrics, right? And it's looking at not just lagging indicators, but looking at leading indicators, understanding your sales process, understanding where where things need, you know, more efficiency. Maybe you can increase the velocity. I mean, because the things, sometimes the things that contribute to better deals and sometimes it's something like velocity. Maybe your velocity is too long and you end up with with too many interactions because you're not dealing with this situation properly and therefore you're distracted 
from working on other deals. So there's lots of different, as you said, levers you can pull. But if you don't know what, if you don't have any, if you don't track them and you don't understand the history of them, then they're not that they're not that useful to you. Being a VP of sales is probably the most tactical role in business. Mm -hmm. um, it is, you know, to use a, you know, not to be funny here, but to use a sports reference, like if you're watching a football game, you are the head coach with the headset on, calling all the plays on the field, dealing with all the coaching staff, getting all of the feedback from the control room or the the the, the box, and constantly tweaking every single thing, player in, player out. Call this play, don't call that play, which rolls up into a broader level strategy, but your job is to execute on that strategy. And you have to understand the strategy, right? And yeah. you kind of have to under, like, I, I kind of equate it to if you're going to go run your sales team and you don't really fluently, totally understand the financial game you're playing in the business that you're in, it's like playing a football game without knowing the rules. Right? Yeah. Like, and, and, and that's what it comes down to. So it, it all starts with understanding those key, key parts of the financial plan. And then as a sales leader, you determine what plays you're going to run relative to that financial plan. And you're never like, you're never going to get discredited for understanding something, seeing that it's incorrect and seeing that's broken, trying to fix it and then failing at it. You're actually mm -hmm. going to get credit for that. Yeah. Right. Um, and that's what your job is. Your job is to just understand what's going on, what's going wrong, what's going right. And, and putting your best foot forward on the actions to take yeah and and unfortunately a lot of people who get promoted into a sales leader position which i think is i mean and i, and I have great sympathy for them because number one they're often promoted out of being a salesperson never given any management training never given any guidance it's just like oh you're really good so if you're really good then just everybody copy you and you'll and it'll be fantastic which we know doesn't work and then they get kind of sucked into focus completely at the end of the, the the funnel like on the deals trying to help you know close them being a super closer and never mm -hmm. pulling back to do the things that you're talking about yeah i mean the the quintessential sign of a bad sales manager that has been disguising themselves as a good sales <laughs> manager is when you take a top rep who's on that team and you move them to a different team and all of a sudden they become a mediocre rep. Because then what you find is that the manager who was most recently a sales rep was closing all their deals for them. Mm -hmm. um, which again, it gets, it gets something done for the business in yep. that moment, no doubt, but you have that team is not predictable at all. Right. Yeah. There, there's no predictability built, built into that team. And that's something you have to address, you know, if, you, if you're kind of building for the long haul. Mm -hmm. And no, I think that's a, I think that's an excellent point. And and to your point, your point about predictability, because that's at the end of the day. And you again, alluded to this earlier is that um, profitability is now something that uh, more people are paying attention to. So predictability is massive when it comes to revenue and forecasting and all of that, because you can't gauge what you're going to spend, what you're going to invest if you can't if you can't rely on forecasts and you and there's no predictability in your revenue, then it's business planning is almost impossible. Yeah, and, and this is this is where we screw up people's lives, right? Because mm -hmm. we hire roles that we shouldn't have hired for. We have to make up for it by setting quotas that the team can't hit because there's not enough pipeline carry. You have reps missing target. People are getting riffed. People are getting pipped, and mm -hmm. that's really where the talk, where, where so much of the sales culture toxicity stems from. In in my opinion, is is just a a lack of fundamental understanding of like what you can. No, I, I would I would agree with you absolutely. It's uh, I think that's a great that's a great great point because you're correct. Is uh, we just we just bring people in and we hire people and all of that and then we go i mean there's a tradition as you know kind of up in silicon valley is like these companies like hire 20 people sales people immediately in a five workout it's great right normally it's like one works out but i, I mean i i had a mm -hmm. i had a more severe uh, actually sorry my headphones stopped working so no, take yeah no off. worries um i had a more severe experience in my career where 
one of the companies I worked for, I mean, we were bringing in around 40 sales reps every quarter. Mm -hmm. And we, I think we're like, our hit rate was like five out of 40 or like be there the following quarter. And man, that was, that was brutal. I was a rep at the time Mm -hmm. and I was, I was, I was doing my job. I was hitting my numbers, but the emotional toll that that takes on you, even when you are a good rep and you're not in the problem area, can't be understated. Yeah, no, I mean, I, I, I totally agree with you. And, and as you said, I mean, it's, it's, it's a waste of money, but it's screwing with people's lives too. And, uh, and, it, and it's, just, yeah, it's just not a good, it's just not a good, a good way of doing things. And, and I think now, well, I, I think the, the pendulum has swung a little bit back now because people have a lot more choices and can work remotely and all of that. You know, I think there's, um, it's not so easy to, to churn and burn these people as it once was. Yeah. I mean, my philosophy is if like, the sales reps we have in place today better be begging for mercy that their calendar is so full that they cannot get to the customers on their calendar in their CRM for me to yeah. go hire more. Right? Yeah. Uh, like <laughs> truly. Um, That's yeah. we we have the we have exactly the same philosophy. It's like when people are maxed out is when we hire. <laughs> Yeah, you, you, you don't like, and, and this is it's such a good, it's such a actually ridiculous thing when you say it out loud, yeah. but it's like, oh, nobody's hitting quota. Hire more. We, we should go hire more, more sales reps. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, and it's like uh, it is, and and the and the thing about it is, you know right well, and I've seen it is this happens nonstop. It happens more than you would care to to uh, to imagine. You know, one of, one of the best pieces of advice I ever got on hiring was from somebody early in my career was that the biggest trap I would fall into as a hiring manager was something called the hero's fallacy, which Mm -hmm. is that I would think that just hiring somebody or a group of people would solve my problems. Right. And generally that's not the case. Like they'll, they'll help you solve your problems Mm -hmm. maybe, but oftentimes your problems might need to be solved before you hire them. Um, and there is, there is no, there is no hero that's coming to save the day, right? It's, uh, you got to kind of grind through it. Yeah. No, I was, I've always reminds me of like when, when like a company will do an assessment or something and then they'll go, we have a communication problem in this company. So let's get some communication software that can enable better communication. And all you end up getting is, is crappy communication just done more efficiently. I don't know. It's not, it doesn't fix the problem to your point. I mean, if there are problems in the company, hiring in people is not going to fix the problem. Putting in technology is not going to fix the problem. It can help the problem. But if you don't know, if you haven't actually looked at the problem and solved the problem, you know, you're. Yeah. Or at a very minimum, have like a real plan on how this is going to come together to solve the problem. Exactly. Well, listen, this has been fantastic, Tommy. All Tommy's information is going to be below this video. But before we go, please do tell people a little bit more about you and your company. Yeah. So uh, I've been a VP of sales uh, most of my career. Started my career as an STR, an AE, then, you know, rent sales leadership. And as I mentioned before, I had a really hard time with P&L fluency. Um, and it was something that I recognized that if I didn't do well, I would wreak havoc on the company. And probably on people's lives because I'd hire people that we didn't need or set quotas we couldn't obtain. Um, so I started Rhythm to help democratize a lot of those insights and uh, plays that you can run when you actually have to make decisions relative to your financial plan. So we connect your CRM, we connect your financial data. It's a two minute setup process. And then we're going to continuously monitor your plan for profitability and things that you can do to sort of maximize uh, your revenue take and decisions that you can make for the organization. Yeah, fantastic. Well, listen, I would encourage you to check it out. This is good stuff because I guarantee you there's a lot of sales organizations who are not paying attention to this and it could make a massive difference to your business. So I encourage you to go check it out. Uh, Thanks again, Tommy. Thank you for watching and listening. See you all again very soon. Thanks, John. (laughs) 